So um, my slides I will make available. If anybody wants them, we'll figure out a way for you to get them. There's a lot of links on the slides to some of the things I'll talk about. There's going to be some things I'm not going to be able to get to, um, and you'll see. But if you would like the slides, we'll figure out how you can get them. Um, OK, so what I'm going to focus on here, um, so fourth wave now is, where's my clicker? Here it is. OK, I was going to do a little bit of a history, but in the interest of time, I really don't have time to do that. A lot of people know about fourth wave now. You can ask me if you can catch me later. Um, what I'm going to focus on is uh, maybe what we're best known for, which is exposing uh, the more extreme aspects of gender medicine. And uh, one of the ways we have done that, and I just want to say that I've had some helpers. They can't be public for reasons that probably most people in this room understand. Some of them are in this room. Um, one of the things we did was to cultivate informants in online groups, clinician groups, uh, what I'm calling a firm only parent groups, um, as well as people to go to gender conferences and record stuff for us. So um, I'm actually going to touch on about four things, which are kind of, to me, the extreme aspects which we revealed many years ago, but which are still not adequately talked about, in my opinion. Um, and one of the things that is really not talked about much is what these affirm only parents. Um, so the four things I'm going to touch on here uh, today are the suicide or transition false binary is what I call it. There's more attention on it now. A lot of people are challenging it, but we have to keep challenging it because it is the showstopper. It's the trump card. Any parent knows that if, your if you thought your child was going to commit suicide, you would do anything in your power to prevent it. And I do believe that is a lot of why we're seeing a lot of parents going with this. Um, I've seen a lot inside these affirming parent groups um, and they all talk about it. They all talk about it. So suicide or transition, I'm going to touch on uh, sexual function, uh, impaired sexual function with uh, the blockers plus cross-sex hormone uh, kids. Um, some aspects of extreme social transition, you'll see what I'm talking about, and then sterilization. Um, and so what we've got is we have these extremist clinicians, and I do think they're extremists, but they are the mainstream here in the US, um, are, are fueling this. Um, and it's to the point now where the executive branch of our US government is essentially, uh, it's, it's official policy of the executive branch of our government. So here's just a screenshot. Um, Parents of transgender children. This group has almost 8,000 members. We've had informants in that group. It's been very uh, informative about what's going on in there. <clears throat> so the largest, the one where you see the big screenshot, has almost 8,000 members. There's some very well-known parent activists in the group. Um, I'm kind of making a point of not mentioning children who are minors, um, so I'm, you may know who I'm talking about. Uh, one of the moderators, her child was on the cover of National Geographic a few years ago. Um, Jazz Jennings' mom is in there. Um, and then the Human Rights Campaign, uh, a very well-funded uh, trans activist organization, has a parent council, and they are very active. So I wanted to just linger on this for a moment and to say that those people are just as determined to keep a firm only going as we are to slow it down. And for me, this is kind of a Zen koan, if you know what that means. It's a conundrum. They're there. They're not going away. Um, over here we see, and it's not just parents. It's kids who transitioned as children who are now adults. So I don't know how many of you know of Nicole Maines. She was one of the first um, child transitioners in the US at the first clinic, uh, the clinic in Boston. 2007, it opened. So you see Nicole Maines at the top picture there, was involved in a very public bathroom uh, 
battle in, in the state of Maine. And now Nicole is a very successful actor. Um, you can look her up. She's uh, like a superwoman type character. Um, and I also would just like to point out, I believe it's important to understand the perspective of these affirm only parents and some of the adults who transitioned as children who now are advocates for the practice. And right, you'll see here, becoming Nicole is a, is a really interesting, uh, it's about 90 minutes. You see the entire Maine's family and uh, Nicole's doctor. So this is my opinion on this. The Pandora's box is open. I, this is just my personal feeling. I don't think we're going to fully ban child transition. Would, would I like it not to exist? Absolutely. I don't think it's realistic. Um, I think if you look down at the bold at the bottom, if we can do what they're doing in Europe, and I think there's hope that we can do that because so many of these countries have slowed it down. I think we can, we can do that. We can make desistance preferable to medical intervention. Again, it used to be, it used to be. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the trump card. Okay, suicide or transition. I'm not gonna go into, I think many people in this room have been studying it, writing about it, talking about it. It's a false binary. There's more than one way to support a child. It's not a binary choice. Um, I think we have to keep pounding at this, keep pounding at it, because it is, uh, it's the bottom line. Okay, if we can try and do this one, this slide. So before you start it though, so this was, I just wanted a couple examples from the horse's mouth. You know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words, a video's worth a million. Here we have 2016, uh, Joel Baum, who uh, is a leading person in Gender Spectrum. Gender Spectrum is one of the organizations that is entwined with our U.S. federal government. Um, that, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So if we could play that, there's, you should be able to click the, um, the image on the left. There you go. At the end of the day, it is the parents' call. Our hope is that they will truly make an informed decision. And I feel like one of our roles is to say, just make sure you have all the information as you make that decision, which includes you can either have grandchildren or not have a kid anymore, either because they've ended the relationship with you or in some cases because they've chosen a, a more dangerous path for themselves. And you know, again, we can't. So we know what he's saying there. Suicide or transition. You sell, he go, they go on to say that you know, a lot of parents want grandchildren, kind of selfish, you need to follow your child's dreams, okay, 2016. I'm not gonna play this one. We see Diane Aronsaft on the BBC, interviewed by Louis Theroux, 2018. He asked, well, what if they regret it later? At least they'll be alive to regret it. 2012, going all the way back to 2012, NBC Dateline. We have Dr. Johanna Olson Kennedy of LA Children's Hospital. Probably most people know who she is. Uh, interviewer says, well, hang on. How can these kids make a decision about bio children? Well, they make the decision to kill themselves at 12 or 13. Now, these, yeah, we know these are the people who've been in the media the most. They still are the people who are in the media the most. Um, it's still a thing, the, the use of suicidality. And here, I just wanted to jump forward. Uh, just a few days ago, Mia Ashton, who's here with us, uh, she, this is a tweet from her on October 30th where they're stickering in Ontario about 45% of trans kids attempt suicide. Dr. Levine, is that correct? Is it correct that 45% of them? That's, it was a rhetorical question, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, very recently, uh, Dr. Ka, I, boy, I'm not going to pronounce it right, Kal Tiala, just same, a few days ago, pushed back on this. This is a clinician, okay? It's, uh, you see at the very bottom, it is dishonest and extremely unethical to pressure parents into approving gender transition. It's rare, okay. 
What about sexual function, okay? So in 20, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but in 2017, we wrote an article and we featured, you can see over there a screenshot from the International Transgender Health Facebook page. It used to be a public page, it's now private. Um, they were talking to each other, some top clinicians in there, I don't know how well you can see it. Um, they don't know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Uh, we'll find out, I guess. Then in 2022, this was quite the bombshell, at least on Twitter it was. Uh, Dr. Marcy Bowers, a well-known gender doctor, happens to be a trans woman. This is a, a Zoom session that she had with other clinicians in which she said they don't have orgasms. I mean, it's really about zero. So when I see these things, I always think, okay, well, then are you gonna say we should stop this practice? I think it's fair to say most humans think orgasm is an important experience. Um, no, no, let's teach them how to masturbate before they're interested even in masturbating um, and see if that will help. Okay, so here you see uh, from one of our informants a thread it was viewed almost a million times on Twitter that we put up. They're all talking about sex toys and techniques for their children. Now, when people looked at this uh, on Twitter, a lot of the comments were, oh, these crazy parents, and how can they do that? And they're pedophiles and all this kind of stuff. But see, this is what the clinicians are telling them to do. This, this isn't just, oh, they just pulled it out of their, their rear end that they should teach their kids how to masturbate. So this is the echo chamber. They know, the media isn't telling. Have you seen an article in the mainstream media about sexual function? The mainstream media? I haven't. But these parents, they know. Okay. <clears throat> Touch on what I'm calling extreme social transition. Um, and that includes things like rubber penises for very young children. I've seen thousands, I say hundreds, I've seen thousands of posts in these affirm-only groups talking about buying rubber penises for their, their little girls, okay? There's a, there's a business called Transwear. I accessed this just a couple days ago. It's still live. You can see on the right, best bump for the little guys, okay? And they advertise on their site as young as four years old. So somebody's buying these products. Or some are, there's some homemade ones, do it yourself with socks and Play-Doh over here on the left. And then, you know, the analogy for the other sex is tucking, you know, teaching the little boys how to tuck their genitals. Uh, something called Leo Lines is a um, Etsy store that sells those things. So once again, where does this come from, right? Well, here you see Children's Hospital LA advising how do you do tucking. Just don't use duct tape, so I guess there's that. that that's good. So this is my question. I see the, the other thing that you observe in these groups is they talk about their clinicians all the time. They love their clinicians, you know. I can't believe that they're not going to their clinicians and telling them that they're purchasing these products. Because if the clinicians were saying what I would suggest they say in the second post, a uh, uh, bullet point, yeah, maybe affirm your child, but not the best idea to send them to school with a rubber penis. Um, I don't know. Uh, any mainstream journalists willing to ask about this? It'd be, it'd be good for them to be questioned. I'm gonna run through this very quickly. You know, there's this whole myth out there that minors don't get surgery, we know they do. Uh, there's a, in the clinical literature, the Journal of Sexual Medicine, there was an anonymized survey uh, talking about the surgeons who do underage of vaginoplasties. And they say junior year in high school is ideal because they're too busy when they're in college and distracted to keep up with dilation. So it's good to have mom and dad involved. You, you saw that on, it, people who watched I Am Jazz, that's exact, they talk about that right there on the show. 
So here's some more. If you do get my slides, you'll see all this. These are several screenshots from that 2017 study. Um, I'm going to skip through these because I, I want to not run over time. Just more examples uh, of underage surgeries. Here was a gender spectrum conference in 2018. We sent an informant there in which uh, Kaiser Permanente clinician says they've done top surgery on 12-year-olds and vaginoplasty on 16-year-olds. Um, this was also the source of what's become a rather famous um, little clip of Johanna Olson Kennedy saying, hey, if you regret having your breasts removed as a teenager, you can just go get some later. So all of this is linked in the slides. I told you I had way too much material. Um, <laughs> sterilization, okay? I think it's a human rights violation to sterilize children, okay? But it's not a secret. It's not a secret at all. The clinicians have talked about it for years. It's one of the things when I learned about it early on, I was like, oh, well, when the world knows this, this will stop. I still think most of the public don't really know this. Um, don't have time. I wanted to play this clip, but is, here we have time. Should we do it? Do I have time? Okay, see if you can run that one. And the other issue that's a showstopper now for many parents around giving consent to puberty blockers is the fertility issue. That if the child goes straight from puberty blockers directly to cross-sex hormones, they, at this point in history, are pretty much forfeiting uh, their fertility, and so they will not have a gen genetically related child. And there's a lot of parents who have dreams of becoming grandparents. Okay, you can and it's very hard. Any parent who would balk at the idea of sterilizing their own 12-year-old? Yeah, just selfish desire for grandchildren. Can I keep going here? Yes. So even though we, we know this, the clinicians know it, we have certain dissemblers who are less than honest. I just had to put this up here, Dr. Jack Turbin on Twitter, saying, yeah, you can freeze them. You can freeze the gametes. Well, no, you can't. Immature gametes cannot be frozen. And here we have Seattle Children's Hospital saying just that. If you want to have children, you have to go through your birth assigned puberty. Skipping this one. I'm going to just touch on this one. I would love to see this more coverage of this, the journalists in the audience. I haven't seen anyone else talk about this uh, other than us. She did a dream. So Di Diane Aronsaft is a developmental psychologist by training. In this Zoom session, she, she says, they don't understand, and you shouldn't talk to them about it too much. It's too much information. Again, she doesn't suggest maybe we shouldn't do this because they don't understand what it means to give up their fertility. We'll just find out. She literally, this is her slide, the top one. It's for us to start finding that out, and we are. In other words, find out how they're gonna feel when they're older after they already made this decision the second slide her colleague presented and said, this might not even matter anymore. They may be irrelevant because we're moving on to stem cell reproduction. Anybody who gets the slides can see this. You know, across town, we've got uh, the US PATH conference. WPATH, US PATH is the US franchise. We got several recordings in 2017 from informants uh, if you haven't listened to these or read the articles, it's worth your time, especially the one uh, where Johanna Olson Kennedy uh, talks an eight-year-old girl into thinking she's a Pop-Tart in the wrong package. Our second in command, most powerful health official in the federal government, as I mentioned, our federal government basically has gender transition for children as official policy. This is uh, Rachel Levine before transition. Rachel Levine said, I'm glad I waited because otherwise I wouldn't have my children. 
So which is it? It's worth it to sterilize these children because of their crippling dysphoria, or it's worth it to wait to have children? Do as I say, not as I do. Okay, don't have time for these. There's lots. I do want to point out that Joe Biden didn't just start uh, getting on board with pediatric transition in his presidency. He has a foundation which partnered with Gender Spectrum in 2019. So uh, this seems to be a rather long-standing interest. And again, it's de facto U.S. executive branch policy. I've got Levine, uh, his confirmation hearing. He, I would call Levine an extremist clinician. Uh, as physician general in Pennsylvania, he counseled, uh, and he was questioned about this in his confirmation hearing. He counseled that if you're street, treating street youth, you should accelerate to cross-sex hormones because otherwise they'll get them on the black market. Who gave informed consent to these kids? For these kids? All right, I'm almost done here. I've got lots of stuff. Uh, so last year was a big splash. The executive branch, several agencies uh, put out um, guidance, let's call it. Um, and there's, you've got examples here from several different agencies uh, counseling pediatric medical transition. This is the one I do want to describe because I found it so amazing. So this is a letter, uh, March 31st, 2022, Department of Justice to the states, U.S. states. Um, it's, it's a threat. It basically says, if you refuse medical transition to a youth seeking it, you may be engaging in unconstitutional discrimination. And in the letter, you'll see it mentions the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And that's all I have time for. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.